Hello and welcome to The Right Side. This is the show where we take a look at today's news, views, trends, and opinions from a decidedly conservative perspective. We're brought to you by the Liberty Forum of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Shane Patrick Connolly, and joining me today is Nick Adams. Nick is a four-time best-selling author, a radio and television commentator, and the founder and executive director of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, or FLAG. The foundation reaches out to elementary, middle, and high schools and educates them on patriotic pride and bridging the major civics deficiency that exists in our country. So Nick is a legal immigrant and a green card holder here in the United States. Welcome, Nick. Good day, Shane. Great to be with you. Well, thank you for joining us. Let's begin with your own beginnings. Um, where did your love affair with the United States begin? That's a really good question, Shane. Look, for as long as I can possibly remember, I was magnetized to the United States of America. It was something about the energy, something about the optimism, something about the opportunity, something about the electricity that you really feel being here. And as a young man growing up in Sydney, Australia, watching all kinds of different television and being exposed to various Americana types of things, I realized that this was a profoundly different place. And as I matured and as I studied American politics at university, I really began to understand that America was more than just a country, that it was an idea, that it was a culture, that it was a value system. And it was a value system that I very much appreciated. And it was a value system that I really had a deep affection for. And I discovered that really I was an American trapped inside an Australian body. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to get to the United States of America. And I came over here for the first time when I was 24 years old in 2009. It took me a long time to get my green card. It's a very difficult process when you come to America the right way. Uh, four and a half years, it cost me close to $50,000. But I finally legally immigrated here on uh, the 29th of July, 2016. Mm. I'm three and a half years in, which means that in about a year and a half's time, I'm going to be eligible to become a citizen. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Excellent. Congratulations on that. Thank you. It's quite an accomplishment. Um, well, when did you become interested in politics in general? Um, was that back in your home country or here in the United States? Uh... Shane, I always had a desire to help people. And when I was at university, I recognized that I was a conservative, and so I joined the young conservatives on campus. And that kind of led to all different forms of opportunity presenting themselves, one of which was to run for local government. And at the age of 19, uh, I became one of the youngest ever elected councillors, or councilmen as they're called here, uh, in Sydney, Australia. The first election I ever voted in, I voted for myself. Uh, it's all kind of been downhill since then. Uh, and then just eight days after my 21st birthday, on the 13th of September 2005, I was elected the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history in Sydney. So. That's kind of how uh, my interest and foray into politics began. It was a rather auspicious beginning. Uh, and since that time, I've now come over to the United States because I felt that this was the place that would afford me the most freedom and the most opportunity to achieve the dreams that God put in my heart. And since moving here, I've really had a wonderful time of living the famed American dream. Well, what is it about America that is unique? Um, you know, Australia, Canada, Spain, all of these liberal democracies throughout the world that exist. Why is America different from some of these or all of these countries? What's unique? You know, Shane, when you are born in the United States of America, it's very difficult for you to fully appreciate what the rest of the world is like. Because if you've only ever known one thing, then you think that that's just the status quo, that's just normal. And the American experience, the American experiment is profoundly abnormal. 
in the context of history, in the context of culture, and everything that we've witnessed in the last 5,000 years of recorded human history. Here in the United States of America, it's the only country in the world where you can really blaze a trail and leave a legacy, where success is not yet resented but still admired and aspired to, where you can colour outside of the lines and not be punished, where you can rise above any set of circumstances to go on and achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. Here in the United States of America, it's the only place where your first language or your last name means absolutely nothing, where people tend to strive for greatness as opposed to mediocrity, where the Constitution sets out the powers of the individual and the restraints of the government. In every other country, whenever anything even remotely similar to the United States Constitution has been created, it's always done precisely the opposite. It's set out the powers of the government and the limits of the individual. So for all of these reasons, political, founding principles, cultural, the United States of America really is a place that you can say, if you're born here, or the day that you move here, you win the lottery of life. You really do. And that's a message that I deliver to elementary, middle and public high schools all across the country uh, as often as I possibly can because it's really important for children to understand. And my favourite part is that this is the only country in the world where you can fail as many times as you need to. Failure is unavoidable in life. It's not something that we should strive for, but I want young Americans to realise that in this country, unlike anywhere else, it's not fatal. You can fall down 5,000 times, but if you've got grit, determination and hustle and you're willing to perspire and persevere against any set of circumstances presented to you, you're going to end up being really successful. And the great American stories, whether we look at Thomas Edison with the light bulb, more than a thousand attempts, whether we look at the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, losing the first 12 elections on the trot, whether we look at Walt Disney and Henry Ford both going bankrupt twice, almost three times, whether you look at our current President of the United States, who I think formally declared bankruptcy six different times, uh, whether you go and have a look uh, at Colonel Sanders for Kentucky Fried Chicken, mm -hmm. who had his recipe rejected 1,009 times before he got a taker. The theme throughout American history has been that those that have got a vision, those that have got a dream, and those that exercise an unbending, unwavering, unquenchable desire for success, they're the ones that leave a legacy way beyond their time on this earth. Now, that's, those are some amazing examples of success, both from the past and from recent history. Um, why do you think that some people are talking as if these opportunities don't exist today? I think of uh, some of our uh, recent Congress people, Ilhan Omar, who herself is an immigrant um, from Somalia, and Rashida Tlaib from a family of immigrants. Um, they say that the wealth gap has grown and opportunities like this are impossible to achieve, essentially, um, or that's the gist of what they talk about, and that government needs to step in and do things for you because you won't be able to succeed. What's the rejoinder to that? Well, right? Shane, look, I consider all of that bunkum. I think that all of that is absolute nonsense. And I think it's nonsense because I live it every day, I see it every day. Every legal immigrant that I speak to is very patriotic, very appreciative of what this country has allowed them to achieve. They recognise that if they had stayed where they were, they would never have been able to accomplish what they managed to accomplish in this country. Uh, but I think in order to enjoy the spoils of American opportunity, you've got to have an American approach to things. And I would suggest that some of those personalities that you referenced there 
don't really have an American mindset, don't really have an American attitude, don't really appreciate the things about America that would allow uh, people to come here with nothing and make everything. I think they've been brainwashed. I think they continue to brainwash others. I think that anybody with an objective analysis of American culture will tell you that, uh, yes, it very much is a society. When you have freedom, when you have freedom, you're going to have extreme outcomes. There's no doubt about that. Freedom will not deliver mediocrity. It won't deliver just a kind of balanced thing. You're going to have people that are super successful and you're going to have people that are on the street. But at the end of the day, the real opportunity comes from maximum freedom. And if we start to allow America to have this large and obtrusive and intrusive government affecting the lives of its citizens, if we don't exercise fidelity to the vision that our founders had and this place becomes like everywhere else, then I think that Representative Ilhan Omar and Representative Alexandria Cortez and all of those other socialists are going to end up turning America into the place that, that they left or the place that they wish America was like. So you've been going out to schools and bringing this message of the greatness of America and our liberties and constitutional order to students. And you touched upon um, the fact that most immigrants really appreciate these things in our country. And I, I think they appreciate them because they weren't reflected in where they came from in the same way. Um, how is this message being received in schools? firstly, and then by the immigrant community more generally? So Shane, back in 2016, uh, I began the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, which is a 501c3 educational nonprofit. Mm. And it is focused on two very simple things. Number one, teaching civics, and number two, putting patriotism back in public schools. And we do it three ways. Number one, through the creation and distribution of kid-friendly resources relating to the founding documents, number two, through classroom visits, and number three, through professional development for teachers, where we teach teachers how to incorporate American exceptionalism and patriotism into their lesson plans and curriculum development. I did it because in 2016, I went into 42 different public schools across eight different states. And I knew that what I would find would likely be shocking, but nothing could possibly have prepared me for just how bad. Hmm. I discovered that today's young Americans have not even a basic knowledge or appreciation of our three founding documents, the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Federalist Papers. So. I decided to do something about that and we got all of those documents into plain, simple and easy to understand English that even a fifth grader can comprehend. And our resources now are in the hands of more, almost three quarters of a million, 750,000 public school students across all 50 states. FLAG is a exponentially growing organisation. We're very well, well received by schools. Uh, and I know that for many conservatives that might surprise them, but when you are going in there, when you are teaching civics, when you are presenting kid-friendly constitutions, and when you're going in with such a positive and uplifting message like we do, which is the day that you were born here, the day that you moved here is the day that you win the lottery of life, and no one's going to stop you. This is a country where you can do anything. Uh, it's very hard even for the most hardened of the left to object. Well, that's a really encouraging news to hear that this is happening in our country and that because I do think that unless you've come through the naturalization process where you get an education into American civics and some of these documents um, I, I, and you're born here and we take a lot for granted, we we haven't been exposed to, to a lot of that information. And so I think it's a critical uh, mission that you're on and uh, we appreciate what you're doing.
in that area. Thank you very much. So uh, given that you're, you're uh, seeking to educate and whatnot, uh, what do you see, though, as the biggest threats facing the United States? Um, is it external issues or internal issues or, or, or this lack of education? Oh. It's a really good question. It's a really good question, Shane. Look, I believe that America right now is under extraordinary threat from a number of different sources. There are certainly external threats, but the threats that concern me the most are internal ones. Uh, I think that America is big enough to be able to deal with foreign enemies. Uh, what keeps me up at night is whether or not America can deal with the anti-American disease within us, amongst us, back here at home, that so many young people have been infected with. And my commitment is to making sure that the 21st century remains an American century because there are no guarantees in life but I can give you this guarantee if the 21st century is not an American century it will not be a free century so we're talking not just about the fate of the United States we're talking about the fate of the entire world as we know it I believe and it's often an unpopular view amongst conservatives but I believe that the true fight for our country and for the American soul is in public schools. Many conservatives think that it's on college campuses. Mm -hmm. I believe that today in 2019, by the time a young person goes through, sets foot on their campus for the first time of their college, the indoctrination that began the moment they walk through their gates of the elementary school is well and truly complete. And I think the way that we can rescue this country, the way that we can preside over a patriotic constitutional renaissance is by making sure that we get to young Americans as early as possible, even in elementary school, and we begin the process of making them aware of how special and how unique the United States of America is. I want to tie their personal ambition to patriotism. I want them to realize that there are a certain set of conditions here in the United States of America that we cannot lose because if we do lose them, then they are less likely to be able to achieve their dream. Now, do you see there any intentionality behind this, what you've characterized as an indoctrination that occurs in the schools? Um, is it found in the texts they're using? Uh, what's occurring in the system? Or is it just a lack of focus and an unintentional uh, uh, neglect? Shane, for the last 60 years, there's been a culture war raging in this country. But only one side has been fighting it. <laughs> They've done it with lies, violence, the threat of violence, and the hostile takeovers of universities. They are dedicated to nothing short of our annihilation. And in the pursuit of that objective, they are governed only by the rules of Saul Alinsky and the Chicago mob. While this culture war has raged, we conservatives, we hardworking, everyday, regular, ordinary American men and women have been busy paying off our mortgages, growing our businesses, saving up our money to send our children off to college. And we have consistently and constantly and continually sought the high ground and elevated things like collegiality and dignity and propriety to the point now where we wake up in the morning, we almost choke on our bacon and eggs mm -hmm. as we watch the television because we cannot believe what we are seeing. The local high school down the road is changing its name. The statue outside the courthouse that's been there for eons has been designated for removal. The elementary school two counties away has officially changed the school calendar to read from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Day in and day out there is a relentless assault on American values, a relentless assault on all of the things that you and I, Shane, love about America. And it's for two reasons. Number one, all of the cultural institutions that are 
that generate our culture are in the hands of people that want to fundamentally transform it. Mm. They are people that don't love America the way that you and I love America. They are people that don't love the things about America that you and I love about America. They want to change America into something that it isn't, something that it has never been, and quite frankly, something that it should never be. The second reason is what I call a passion gap. And it's a painful thing to say. But the truth is that for the last 60 years, the left in this country have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. Hmm. For the last 60 years, the left in this country have wanted to destroy America more than we have wanted to protect it. And ultimately, this war that we did not start, but we will finish, this war that we did not invite, but we will attend, this war is nothing more than a street fight. It's going to come down to who wants it the most. And until we can match them in passion, in intensity, and in strategy, we're going to continue to lose all of those values. Yes, what is going on in public schools, in college campuses, in the media, make no mistake about it, it is unbelievably deliberate, extremely intentional. They are trying to take down America from within. They're trying to weaken American confidence. They're trying to remove individualism. They're trying to eliminate our pride. And in doing so, they're transforming the American dream into the European nightmare. This is our cause. This is our fight. We've got to stop it. Well, have they been aided and abetted in a way by the a media, we'll call uh, establishment or uh, legacy media? Uh, I see it in the almost insane reaction to President Trump and their efforts to nullify the election over the past three years, for example, um, because he's speaking about some of these things that you're talking about, how Americans should be united under American principles. And I think they completely misunderstand his message at times, and they call him all kinds of names. But uh, has he been helpful in uh, kind of turning the tide, or is this just a temporary reprieve? Uh, well, Shane, look, certainly politically, uh, this president is the best thing that's happened to America in a long time. And again, uh, to <laughs> court some controversy amongst fellow conservatives, <laughs> I'll tell you that I believe he's even better than Ronald Reagan. And I never thought that we would see uh, a president, uh, that I would see a president in my lifetime better than Ronald Reagan. But I think that already, even within just his first term, this president has surpassed Ronald Reagan. This is a fight that is multifaceted. Politics is only one part of it. Uh, and to, to use a term, uh, the one thing that trumps politics <laughs> is culture. Mm -hmm. And we can have all of the political victories that we want, but if we are not successful in changing the culture, if we can't reach the hearts and minds of people, then those political victories are not going to have the same impact that we would hope that they would have. So this president is doing an outstanding job I consider him rather Churchillian uh, with a different enemy, but I, I certainly think that he is up there. Uh, he could very well be uh, the greatest man of the, of the 21st century. Well, thank you for that. Now, how can the ordinary uh, person, as we kind of uh, get into our final um, uh, moments here, how can the ordinary American assist you in your efforts and what can they do in their towns and, and, and uh, communities to uh, be effective leaders of, for American liberty? Shane, look, it's a great question. Uh, I invite everyone to go and visit our web page. It's flagusa.org, flagusa.org. Uh, you can just about do anything on that website. You can go and have a look at the work that we do. You can request us to come and speak at a school. You can make a request for resources to be donated to a school. Uh, if you like the work that we're doing and you're in a position to support us financially, you can do that as well. Uh, we are a non-profit. Everything is 100% tax deductible. But what I would really encourage everyday ordinary Americans to do is to take stock of where we are as a country and as a culture right now. 
what we are witnessing uh, every day right now in politics in Washington uh, is, a, is a point that I think many people despair over. And I can certainly understand that. Uh, like I said earlier, we didn't invite this particular cultural war to come to us, but it's come to us. And this right here is Freedom's Coliseum. I believe the rest of the world is too far gone. So freedom, in my mind, Shane is going to either live or die right here in America. And the pages of the history books that haven't been written yet are going to reflect the actions that we determined to take. And I think that every patriotic American should be speaking to their neighbours, speaking to their relatives, speaking to their fellow congregants in their church. They should not submit to political correctness. They should be uh, relegating it right where it belongs, on the dusty bottom bookshelf of some fourth-rate library in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I, I think that everyday Americans should hold their head high uh, and believe in America. Because if you go back throughout history and have a look, Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French nobleman, said that the, what he considered the most amazing thing about the American people was their ability to recorrect a trajectory. Uh, that's really important. So Winston Churchill said that America always does the right thing after exhausting every other option. Uh, so there is a resilience in the American people. And if we can tap into that, then I think that we can become the leaders that we need to be in order to defeat the left that are trying to take our country away from us. Excellent. Well, we thank you for your challenging and optimistic message that you leave us with today. And uh, I'm sure that many will be looking forward to hearing from you at the Liberty Forum. And the Liberty Forum meets every second Tuesday of each month at IFES Hall on 432 Stirlin Road in Mountain View. In January, join James Lillix, American journalist, columnist, and blogger for his talk and he's a frequent contributor to National Review magazine and website as well. February, they have Michelle Malkin, blogger, political commentator, author, and businesswoman. She's the founder of Twitchy.com, a popular Twitter content curation website. And since this is our last show with um, the Liberty Forum as our sponsors, I just wanted to leave us with some important thank yous to our amazing volunteer crew here to our fearless producers, Jim Tuo and Mike Harris, assistant director, Bill Lindemann, Bill McElpine on audio, Bill Lindemann on graphics, Jim Seawright and Marilyn McElpine on cameras, Robin Frank on lighting, the fantastic staff here at KMVT, our past program hosts, the leadership of the Liberty Forum for their many years of generosity, and the many insightful, interesting guests that have appeared here on the show, including Nick Adams. So thank you very much, and you all have a great day.